We're going to continue now with uh, Naomi Beckwith, uh, who was inaugural speaker at ECH last year. And I believe her projects and astute observations have only grown more urgent since our last public encounter. Beckwith is the Manilo uh, Senior Curator at Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago and former curator at Philadelphia's Institute of Contemporary Art and the Studio Museum in Harlem. Her numerous exhibitions include The Freedom Principle, Experiments in Art and Music, 1965 to now, and 30 Seconds Off an Inch, both considering the resonance of Black culture across contemporary art internationally. And she has championed rising artists like Rashid Johnson, Karen Sitter, The Propeller Group, and Lynette Yadomboake. Um, she's contributed to numerous catalogs and publications and served on several juries, including the jury of the 56th Venice Biennale in 2015, and as a commissioner for the 2021 version of the French Pavilion. Um, she's currently trustee um, of, and has been grantee of the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, and is a recipient of the New Leadership Award for Art Table. Um, Naomi is going to share from recent projects, um, and we, greatly look forward to her contribution today. Thank you so much, Natasha, for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Those of you I can see, most of you who I cannot see, greetings from the morning in Chicago here. I want to just start by saying thank you. Thank you for having me back uh, with The Hub. It is a project that I've followed for some years. I was deeply, deeply touched to be invited last year, even more touched to be invited back uh, to participate in this. And so thank you, Natasha, for sort of allowing me to think through my work again. Um, but I also really want to thank the Rajas, <laughs> the Raja family, uh, Pratik and Priyanka, and of course, their amazing team at Experimenter for really sort of putting this together, coordinating in space and in time, coordinating in the virtual world, it's been nothing but seamless. And so I congratulate you on that and also join you in the dedication of remembering those who came before us. I also want to say that the hub is deeply important for me to not only rethink curatorial practice and maybe interrogate our curatorial practice to really learn about other practices, but it's important for me to think about this space as one of kinship. And that's a word that I don't use lightly, but to really think about it as a kind of familial and family structure. And it's been beautiful to be able to participate in that kind of understanding of our practice, really sort of existing in this kind of international structure of really uh, obligation to each other. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen just to make sure it works. I also imagine and I think that the background is sort of Behind, like sort of backwards behind me. So I'm definitely, um, I don't know, I'm outing myself as a little bit of a, 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 a Zoom newbie. So I apologize for that. Uh, and I just hope that you can all see this as a full screen because I can hardly. Um, when I did this talk last year, I kind of took a moment of self-indulgence and started to reflect on uh, on the work that uh, I've been doing throughout the year, uh, really trying to imagine what the conditions were of my work uh, in the world. Uh, it probably goes without saying to this group, but I do truly, truly believe that curatorial work always happens in a historic context, happens uh, in a, a certain set of conditions, uh, whether or not it's responsive to that. And so it's really important to kind of draw out that work and be able to really sort of uh, articulate your work in that condition. Um, so I want to really start, as I did last year, thinking about those conditions that set forth uh, really terms of how I am working now, how I'm working as a curator in the States, how I'm working as a museum curator as well. What are the forces that are really putting pressure on institutions right now? And of course, the first thing that I'm thinking about is this moment of racial reckoning. 
So in case y'all didn't know, and of course you should rightly say, there is a way in which we are no longer just attuned to what's happening in our own localities, but we're thinking about what's happening globally. And what's happening globally, of course, or what's happening in the States right now for us is that we are in a moment of a resurgent pandemic. We are in a moment of a lot of pressure, not only on our health infrastructures, but there is a fair amount of pressure also on our um, uh, sort of academic structures, spaces of learning, and of course, our museum sites. At the MCA, we just reclosed the museum, even though we just opened a show uh, a bit over a week ago. This is a moment where museums are losing revenue, so they're not just dealing with the health implications of not having an audience, but they're also dealing with the financial implications of slash budgets, of uh, having to slash payrolls in many, in many cases, having to cancel shows. And these, this sense of disruption, but also a real profound sense of loss for a lot of people, both loss of family, loss of life, but also even loss of livelihood in the museum field is putting all sorts of pressures and disruptions on institutions. But besides those kind of financial uh, pressures, of course, there is then uh, the calls for ra racial justice and racial reckonings across the country. And I had become somewhat bemused by this gesture that came into the world on Blackout Tuesday. And this was a call for institutions to basically sit in some form of solidarity with Black Lives Matter. I'm actually shocked to find institutions even sitting in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and began to rue on why was it easy for institutions who have been called to task um, about how they have been complicit with structures of white supremacy and maybe even actually pillars uh, of structures of white supremacy, thinking of course, uh, again, about the work of Ariella Aisha Azule. How is it that these institutions uh, from these deep histories can then do this gesture? And the gesture was a simple black square. And my worry, of course, is that that black square is not in fact um, just uh, a kind of moment of solidarity, but it was sort of easy for institutions to enact it because it has this sort of beautiful uh, ambiguity. It is something that reminds many art institutions, I believe, of Malevich and suprimitivism. They just sort of make a nod to the work that they do as aesthetic institutions, but at the same time, um, they can do this gesture uh, uh, that signifies grief. A Blackout Tuesday itself was a project started by two women in the music industry out in LA, two black women who sort of asked for this black square, both as a moment of erasure, uh, signifying the erasure of black bodies after state, uh, state inflicted violence. But it was also a, a moment, uh, or it was also a symbol, I think of grief and of mourning. And that's poignant for me because I am, for those of you who cannot see me, a black woman. And I have to also acknowledge that I am sitting in a moment of perpetual grief. And I'm sitting in a moment of perpetual mourning as I'm faced with a barrage of images of violence against black bodies constantly, daily. And this isn't just something that started in recent moments, recent years, but it's something that has been part even of my upbringing, my education. And I'd like to really think about what it means to like sit in this space of perpetual mourning and grieving, uh, and grieving as something that is not pathological. You know, Freud laid out in his essay on mourning and melancholia uh, as perpetual and persistent mourning as a problem. But I want to really think about the state of perpetual mourning as a kind of ontological condition and a way to define Black life. Um, you know, this is a tall order to do. Uh, I think also culturally in the space of the work of a curator, um, but it's work that I'm starting now. I'm taking it up as part of a curatorial team that's working on a show that was initiated by Oakley Weiser, um, but couldn't be realized before his own passing. Um, it's a show called Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America. And it's going to be staged in, at the New Museum uh, early next year. So I can't present it today. Maybe one day I'll have the chance to talk about it in the future at a hub. 
but it's really a way for me and uh, an advisory team, including uh, the artist Glenn Ligon, uh, Mark Nash, the curator who works with Oakley on his documenta, and Massimilia Gione at the New Museum, to start to give shape to what it means to live under these ontological conditions, and what does it mean to think about artists' aesthetic responses to that condition. The other thing I'm also thinking about is um, uh, the sort of public debates that are circulating around uh, the use of images of violence against black bodies. And in particular, I have been following the case of Sean Leonardo, Leonardo an artist who self-identifies as Afro-Latinx, which is to say he thinks of himself as black and Latino at the same time. And he thinks of himself as someone who has also been deeply traumatized by this barrage of images of, of black uh, death and anti-black violence. And the question is, what can he do with those images? How can he mobilize it? How can he sort of transform that, not only as a way for him to work through his own feelings, but also as a way uh, for him to have a dialogue with the public? And so he started creating the series of charcoal drawings called The Breath of Empty Space and putting those drawings, setting those drawings uh, against a mirrored background so that when you as a viewer sees those drawings, you also see yourself in, implicated in this sort of condition of state violence. Um, that show went up in Baltimore, a show of those drawings went up in Baltimore pretty much without incident. But when Leonardo uh, was set to take that show to Cleveland, then you know, all hell break loose, broke loose. And maybe rightly so. Um, one of the drawings that Leonardo used, uh, or one of the images that Leonardo used in this drawing, was an image of the last moments of Tumia Rice, a 12-year-old child who'd been shot by the Cleveland police just a few years earlier. And uh, his mother, Samira Rice, basically wrote to the museum, along with an advocate, asking that the show not happen because she, as a mother, did not want to face recurring images of her son's death. And Mocha Cleveland canceled the show, but they also canceled it without Sean's knowledge and without consulting him. So then what ensued was this big public debate over claims of censorship uh, versus claims of, of trauma and who was traumatized by what, who had been censored. Uh, and it was a delicate sort of dance that the museum had to undertake. And sadly, the director couldn't really manage that debate and ended up resigning. So we're now in a moment where we're thinking about who owns images, who has rights to images? How can artists really work through appropriation? Again, uh, questions that have come up historically already, especially in the context of white artists, but hadn't really been applied to the case of black artists working with these images. Um, and again, it's a debate that rages on in the public sphere that has yet to be resolved. Furthermore, I'm thinking about the ways in which very similar debates are, are sort of ongoing around a major Philip Guston retrospective that had been set to go up uh, next year in both the US and in the UK. Um, and the organizing museums, probably feeling gun shy after the Sean Leonardo episode, decided to postpone the show over three years into the future. And they postponed it because they said that um, they didn't feel that Gustin's work and his messages wouldn't be well received in, a current, in the current climate um, and that the show needed, and I quote, a cooling off period. And so I've been fascinated then by, you know, these debates about, you know, Again, you cannot censor an artist, an artist who actually stood in solidarity against racism. A lot of his works, by no means all, but a lot of his works were similar to what you see on the screen right now. They are literally these images of Ku Klux Klansmen, the kind of genocidal fraternity, genocidal anti-Black fraternity, amongst other things, um, sort of existing in kind of banal life across the US. You know, you see these hooded Klansmen sort of living 
out everyday scenes. And if anything, it's probably fairly close to the truth. Um, but uh, the worry was that these images in and of themselves would be triggering to an audience. And the museum worried again that it couldn't somehow keep a rein on the debate that was going to ensue. So within that kind of, uh, that kind of ongoing debate, what I have been most interested in and probably worried about is this idea that what's necessary is that cooling off. That somehow the problem of, of the show is the, the social and historic context that we're in now. And it's maybe the overheated passions of the folks who might be criticizing uh, Augustine's image or may not be able, may not be receptive to his message. In other words, it's the climate is the problem, the audience is the problem, but not the structures of the museum, not the way that the museum works. Um, if anything, the museums have said that the answer is to bring in other black voices in the planning of this exhibition, to hire other curators, hire people to do this kind of uh, interpretive work for them, which, well, I mean, smacks to me of something somewhat, somewhat problematic, because the truth of the matter is you should have had these people on staff already. But again, there's nothing wrong or there's no interrogation of how structurally this kind of uh, lack of black voices or even, uh, or even a kind of interrogation of the knee-jerk fear has yet to be uh, examined. So that's what I've been thinking about uh, in the moment. This is what's in the back of my head. This is what's really been informing uh, how I'm thinking about exhibitions and art practice as of now. But I'm going to sort of jump into the projects that uh, Natasha's asked me to speak about today. And I have to sort of thank Natasha actually for taking me to these projects. Uh, I'm speaking in, uh, primarily about a show that I curated in 2013 and wondered for a moment, like, why on earth am I being asked to go back to this? I'm trying to kind of stay in the present and hold on to a, a current and more recent practice. But, you know, I'm seeing already the brilliance of this move to ask me to talk Talk about this show because I can already see uh, some recurrent themes in uh, Natasha's introduction and this brilliant talk by the Rocks Media Collective. So I thank you also for being able to come back to that. But I want to kind of preface my jumping into the show uh, with uh, a little bit of a historic reminder. Uh, and that is that I want to take a look again at the 60s. Um, and I know it's totally cliched to think about the 60s right now, but I really, you know, I can't help it. I think a lot of people can't help it. But I think it's also worth reminding ourselves that in this moment where a lot of activist pressure is being put on museums, that this isn't the first time museums have been called to task to enact structural change. And particularly, it's not the first time it's been called to task by artists to do that work. So I've been thinking about the, the Art Workers Coalition, um, a collective group, um, a kind of loose collective of many even subgroups that came together in 1971. And they formed because the artist Takis um, had walked into MoMA and literally snatched a work of his out of an exhibition. And he did that because he didn't want the work in the show and it went on view without his approval. Now, mind you, this is a work that was in MoMA's uh, collection, so the museum felt that it, they were perfectly in their right to show a work that they own, but Takis really wanted to hold some kind of authority over this object so as long as he was alive. And again, these are debates that continue to this day. And so artists got together to really ask about that question. What is their voice? What is their authority vis-a-vis -vis museums? And also, where do they really fit in in this kind of structural hierarchy of these institutions? Um, and the answer to that, I think, was really interesting, that they positioned themselves literally as laborers. They called themselves, again, the Art Workers Coalition. They began to ask as their sort of beginning moments of, uh, or sort of founding moments as a collective for, um, they began to advocate really for uh, labor practices within uh, institutions or advocate for labor practices, fair labor practices for artists. 
They were asking for uh, resale rights to their work. They were asking for re remuneration uh, for their labor in museums. And they did this through a of performances like the image you see on the right and through protests uh, like the image you see on the left. And I'm fascinated about that kind of legacy of thinking about the artist as labor, really thinking about work, um, what you do uh, as a human being, what you get compensated for. Uh, and uh, above all, I'm really interested in the way that those calls for labor right then expanded uh, over the couple of years that the Art Workers Coalition was active into also thinking again about sort of this structural change at museums, making demands for more women, the inclusion of more women and more artists of color in exhibitions, in collections, on the curatorial team, and actually making, art, uh, making museums more accessible to a public, asking for free days, asking for uh, uh, artists to have special uh, abilities to enter into museums. And what's fascinating to me, of course, is the fact that, well, the only one that really stuck was this free day idea. And so I'm, you know, kind of ruining this moment thinking about what's going to stick from the pressures that we're putting on today. I'm also interested in the legacies that have come out of this. So we have a group active in the US now called WAGE. Sorry, I'm forgetting exactly what the acronym stands for. Uh, WAGE has a price list uh, that can advise museums on how much to pay artists depending on what kind of exhibition uh, and, or what kind of program they do at a museum. Uh, and I'm interested in the way certain groups like the Guerrilla Girls are kind of the spiritual child of these movements, really thinking about what does it mean to do action that lays bare inequalities inside of the cultural world and especially in the museum sphere. But going back to that idea of labor and what artist work is and what labor is, I'm going to discuss a show that I curated in 2013 called Homebodies. And Homebodies was an exhibition that really looked at the domestic sphere as a site of artist work, but also even artist inspiration. And try to imagine what does it mean uh, to kind of position the domestic space as central to artist practice above maybe these kind of romantic notions of the artist studio, especially the kind of heroic uh, male notion of a studio, um, and other sites that are, I think, a bit more celebrated, like the public sphere. What do artists do with materials around them? What do they do when they look more deeply at the space around them? Um, what does it mean to kind of uh, reinvest uh, a sense of creative labor uh, into the domestic sphere? And here you see just a, a sort of installation shot that includes uh, a work um, by an artist named Carlos Rolón. Uh, who also calls himself design, goes by that moniker. And uh, his installation sort of in the foreground left uh, is a work that's a recreation of his family home from the 70s. But it was also a space um, that was a working nail salon where his manicure is in the building. And then behind that, uh, sort of outside of that space, you can see this sculpture by Alexandre Jacunia, which is a collection of mop heads uh, that have been sort of woven and, and sort of macrameed into this large monumental shape. And Jacunia has been thinking for a while about uh, uh, the kind of proletariat work and labor and what does it mean to take the tools of that and uh, bring it up to a kind of monumental and visible scale. The uh, show had three uh, three sort of uh, thematic themes. And the first theme was architectonics. Uh, this is the space by which I was thinking very literally about what it means to kind of uh, refigure uh, or even just figure the domestic space. What does it mean to uh, turn uh, the site of the home into a kind of aesthetic practice? What does it mean to sort of reinvent your life every day? Um, this is also the space where you saw a lot of sculptural intervention where artists were taking uh, fragments of the home uh, and 
uh, sort of recasting it, reforming it into another space. Um, it's also the place in which you, you see a lot of work that was um, a kind of reconfiguring, recreation of the home. And like the sort of De Hossu work all the way in the background, the green silk work, where he's um, almost obsessively recreated these, uh, his uh, living spaces over the years. I was also interested in the way that a lot of these artists began to think about home uh, and the domestic space really uh, as a metaphor uh, or in the moment of transition. So much of this was about having to move, having to shift from site to site, um, a sense of feeling unsettled, um, uh, and, and really trying to grasp what it means to be an immigrant or a stranger in a strange land, but also what does it mean to uh, live in a world where certain things could start to move quite freely and liberally across borders. This is the moment of high globalization, but also the moment after the economic crash of 08, where there's a lot of cynicism around uh, easy globalization. Again, ideas can flow, commodities can flow, the people cannot. And here are a couple works that were in that section, architectonic, again, De Hossu, uh, Wielenstrasse uh, work, and uh, Leslie Hewitt's uh, photographic series, uh, Epiphany of Circumstance. And I was really interested in how both of these artists um, really kind of use the, the language of inversion to, to create their work. De Hossu is um, trying to recreate a solid architectural space, um, something that's hard, durable and protective in a frame of something that's soft, transparent, uh, porous, I like that word that came up before, um, and puncturable. Uh, even with all this sort of care, it feels quite precarious. And Leslie Hewitt is a photographer uh, and sculptor uh, who would stage these beautiful still life works by taking images and objects from her family archive uh, these old albums from the 70s when she was growing up, books and photographs, and situating them in these homes around uh, Queens, where she grew up, Queens, New York. Uh, and this is an area that has a strong Black history, but also an area of constant change. And so here we see in the still life this kind of uncanny and unrealizable image where it feels like all that kind of media uh, uh, that she's brought into the space, the music, the books, the, the images, um, that all those things feel upside down. And that was another kind of aspect of this architectonic section that was quite salient, the ways in which artists were also very attuned to the effects of economic disruptions and all, again, this kind of uh, thinking through uh, the global outreach of capital. Um, there was less attention to its localized effects and what happens uh, when money flows in and out and through communities and through cities, what happens in the space of urban development, but also urban degradation and what communities get invested, uh, investment and what communities get destroyed. The next section uh, uh, was called division of labor. And this was a section that was looking at exactly that. What is it uh, that the home represents in terms of work? What kind of gestures uh, get enacted in the, uh, in the space of a home? And really also, you know, what kind of value do we assign to that? Um, I'm interested in the ways artists took up uh, these gestures of cleaning and care. I love seeing that in the talk that preceded this one. Uh, I love that artists were calling out attention to the ways in which uh, domestic labor was uncompensated, undervalued, uh, and I really took that as a kind of metaphor also for thinking about the practice of crea creative labor as undervalued, un undervalued and uncompensated. And again, you can see in that background um, uh, the Jacunya work uh, and more in the foreground on the wall, uh, Barbara Kruba's work. It's a small world, but not if you have to clean it. And I love, again, Jibish's um, sort of statement about the persistence of cleaning. It's something that needs to happen over and over again. In and of itself is a kind of monumental task. Uh, 
This is obviously a section that's deeply inspired by the feminist movements of the 70s. I'm you know, very much a student of American feminism, thinking about the ways in which women uh, and curators alongside them, women artists and curators like Lucy Lepard, really brought to the forefront the domestic space as a site uh, for identity formation, for subject formation, both for the artists, even for their children and their families, and of course, as a site that can be mined for uh, a set of, of practices that can be brought into the world. Um, the patron saint of that for me, and I think in many, many people, is uh, the artist seen on the right, Miele uh, Landes Meukeles, who did a series of projects that she called maintenance works. And in this one in particular, uh, you see her pouring out the dirty water after mopping the floors of the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut. And so what Ukeles does uh, is basically take on custodial work. There's that word again that Natasha so brilliantly introduced at the top of this. She takes on custodial work and it feels to me like a dual gesture. Uh, the first is to align herself with literally the custodial staff to really bring visible the work and maintenance labor uh, um, that is done by people who are normally behind the scenes and of course probably lowly paid. But it's also a way of uh, thinking through again that kind of persistence of having to do that work, having to do the labor and that that work has to run beside uh, the labor of thinking through a world that is more equitable in terms of women's uh, participation and in terms of people of color's participation. I mean, to imagine that new wor wor world is a labor and you're gonna break some things. And so Eukalis uh, has this brilliant quote that I'm gonna sort of mangle, I'm sure, right now. But she asked, after the revolution, who's gonna take out the garbage on Monday morning? She's asking, are we ready to do both kinds of labor of rebuilding the world? cleaning up after we smash things at the same time. And who do we expect to do that kind of work? Uh, on the left, you see a work by Martha Rossler from her now iconic series, Bringing the War Home. Uh, Rossler probably had more works in the exhibition than anyone. And I'm really fascinated, of course, by the way, um, there's a kind of cleaning and maintenance gesture uh, in one of these works too, um, that's quite different from the one that Eukalis is enacting. What Mar uh, Rossler shows us um, from appropriating images from these kind of domestic magazines is the way in which um, that kind of labor had been glamorized, um, that a kind of media industry had been set up to commoditize this sort of work and sell it back to us. Basically, you know, obviously in the, in the service of selling commodities like vacuum cleaners, but uh, Rossler does something smart by paralleling that sort of selling the space back to us with the way in which the war, the Vietnam War, had been sold to an American public. And here she is, here the model is kind of pulling back the drapes and realizing and seeing the kind of underbelly of capital that it not only shapes what we can have in our home, that it's, that it's not just shapes our sort of lifestyle decisions, but it actually shapes geopolitical uh, politics. A third section of the show is called Psychogeographies. And here's a kind of moody installation shot where you can see some of these works that start putting together a sense of the home as um, uh, more of an emotional space, a space where we have to deal with our emotional interiors, not just with the kind of architecture of what's happening around us. What does it mean to sort of go internal? Uh, what does it mean to turn inside and focus on uh, something that feels more private, even subconscious. And you can see in the foreground on the right, a work by Tatiana Trouvé, this kind of um, uh, wrapped up and bundled mattress that's impossible to move because it's made of concrete. And one of Tony Ausler's sort of um, creepy, uh, creepy uh, installations with these talking heads smashed under, under, a, um, under a mattress. And one of the more exciting pairings for me of this show has been uh, thinking through the work of two women. One, Latoya Ruby Frazier, uh, an artist who's really thought of mostly in the context of someone like Ukelis. 
Uh, she's an artist from the Rust Belt of the United States, uh, Western Pennsylvania, uh, an area sort of ravished by the loss of industry and work there. Uh, she's someone who's done a lot of work with um, what we would call sort of blue collar workers, uh, working class folks, usually unionized workers who uh, find their quality of life uh, degrading as their jobs disappear in a moment of globalization. She's also interested in the, the environmental effects and the effects on the health of those workers there. And we see her here in an earlier series that gives the entire show its name, um, doing a series of gestures, performances, and enactments inside of these homes that have been abandoned uh, in her hometown of Braddock, Pennsylvania. And she's not only just enacting things, she's doing that cloaked literally in the clothes and the bed, the bed things, the bed linens of her deceased grandfather, someone who passed away prematurely given uh, his body being so ravaged by this harsh industrial work. And so I love these kind of um, ghostly ritual gestures that begin to also um, become uh, an invocation of these spirits that still may reside in these homes that may have been abandoned by the living. And I paired that with Francesca Woodman, someone who is now thought of in retrospect and even after her death as a kind of pioneering photographer, has been really taken up um, by feminist thinkers um, uh, as someone who really thought about the precarity of life and a woman's body, especially, and we see one of her kind of moody, blurred photographic images um, that she enacted while on a residency in Rome, where um, like many of her works, she's kind of navigating these domestic spaces as ghosts, uh, appearing as a shadow, as an angel, um, sometimes walking through walls, through these kind of tricks of photography. And you know, it's hard to not see her work as many uh, critics have done in the mode of the death drive, especially given her uh, premature suicide at 22. But what's more fascinating for me is that you know, I did um, the show Home Bodies. I kind of set it aside, went on, did other forms of research. And, you know, like anything else, <laughs> these ideas sort of come back with a vengeance. And so it's now the case, in fact, that um, the MCA in Chicago recently opened an exhibition called The Long Dream. And The Long Dream was a show that was totally collectively curated by an entire division of the museum. There's no singular curatorial uh, sort of author there. I am definitely not it. I'm one of many who really came together in this moment where we have the space to experiment a bit with curatorial practice um, to create an exhibition that wholly consists of artists in Chicago, really thinking about our home city around us. And it has about 80 artists in the show, performance makers, object makers. Uh, it exists online as much as it does in uh, the sort of physical space of the museum. And happily so, because uh, as soon as we opened it, we've had to close the museum again, given resurgent COVID cases. We wanted as a team uh, for the long dream to be a kind of maybe first past reflection on the moment we're in. As I said before, uh, I think one of the, the challenges for all of us going forward is really thinking about how we kind of um, uh, frame this moment uh, and the impossibility of it, uh, how we frame this in terms of curatorial practice, and how do we begin to recognize the aesthetic practices that, um, that come from what has rightly been called an epistemological shift that's happening in the world right now. It's a show that dealt with a lot of things. It uh, dealt with the lasting effects of recurrent injustices, uh, social, economic, and racial injustices. It's a show that's dealing with uh, the anxieties of the moment, uh, the anxieties of uh, being able or incapable of protecting oneself, but also uh, being unable to share physical intimacies with others. It's also really um, trying to think through how do we find some moment of imagination, political imagination, some sense of agency as we look toward the future. Um, 
It is the case, though, that throughout all that, I'm just going to focus on one section of the long dream that's called close at hand. And before I get to that, here's just some quick installation views of the show um, uh, where you can see these kind of multiple practices of sculpture, painting, insulation, and so forth, um, already um, sort of hinting toward these kinds of uh, possibilities and impossibilities of multiplicity and language, really thinking through what's happening to our national polity right now. But the section close at hand is in many ways, uh, for me, a kind of revisiting of some of the issues uh, and questions that I posed in Homebodies. And close at hand was this is a section of the show but whereby we began to think about what does it mean for artists to have to work from home. I'm really sort of bemused by uh, what feels like for many people a sense of maladjustment from trying to, for having to work in their domestic space. And I will also say, just as, uh, you know, uh, as a side, it is really, really uh, difficult for some people to be at home right now. It's actually incredibly dangerous, especially for those who are, under, uh, who are sort of undergoing uh, domestic violence to be at home right now. But I really also have been um, kind of um, demused by, but also maybe somewhat uh, annoyed by um, many folks who are trying to figure out how to stave off boredom. And I'm interested in the way um, this idea of trying to be, uh, trying to have a sort of different moment every day in one's home is the condition of art and the working condition of artists. Sorab uh, Mahebi wrote about this, I think rather, um, rather uh, cogently, and I wish I could quote it, but sorry, I don't have my notes right now, uh, which is to say that that is the challenge right now, to think of one space as a space of reinvention every day. And this, I believe, has been the project uh, of many artists, both working uh, in a studio, but especially those who work from home intentionally or who are forced to work at home now. A couple works that were key for me or a couple projects that have been key for me uh, inside of this uh, segment close at hand um, have been on the left, uh, a project by Alberto Aguilar called Quarantine Regime. And this is a project by an artist who for his, the entirety of his career have been, has been working solely in his home and with his family, turning it as a kind of exhibition space, making these interventions into his domestic space, doing things like making these whimsical sculptures of the furniture that's around him, but also focusing on his family, using memory uh, and the relationships with those that he lives most closely with and most of his time with, using that as a kind of uh, practice. And under the quarantine, he set, himself, set up for himself a series of challenges every day, such as, I'm going to draw a portrait of my son, but only uh, draw for the amount of minutes that are equal to his age. Um, I'm going to draw a portrait of my father, his father that he lost this year, uh, but only within the number of minutes of, of uh, his time on earth. And then on the right, we see this amazing photographic image by a young artist named Guan Yu Xu. And Guan Yu, uh, does this incredible set installations, does these incredible installations inside of his home, in the apartments that he's lived with over the years. But as you can see, the installations are these kind of photographic images and prints, many of which he's taken, uh, some of his travels, uh, some of his, uh, he and his partner together, uh, some are of the domestic space itself, and he sets it up in these like amazing palimpsests so that space begins to disappear. Uh, the relationship between interior and exterior began to disappear. That you kind of get this strange sort of mise-en-scene uh, and the sense of infinity uh, so that this idea of knowing what the space is around you is totally lost. And I'm fascinated by that gesture 
especially for someone who uh, is moving. And again, thinking about what does yeah, it mean apologies. to be- Apologies, we we're yeah. out of time. Um, apologies, we need to ah. continue the dialogue. No worries, no worries at all. Then I'll just quickly wrap up and just say that, again, this focus on close at hand is reminding me and asking me to rethink uh, these questions of labor again. Um, not only what labor happens, but why certain labor has to happen in the home. And I'm interested in the ways artists have presaged this moment, uh, even you know, over 10, almost 15 years ago, thinking about the ways in which our labor has now really moved into the domestic space, both as white collar workers, um, that we can't work in an office space before, but also um, the way in which things like uh, factory labor has been atomized into domestic spaces with especially in the garment trade, people kind of having to take the supply chain into the house. Um, and I'll just close out by saying, you know, this is the fantasy of labor that we've been sold at the moment, that we're all going to sort of uh, exist in these spaces where we don't have to take notes, <laughs> we don't have, you know, any tools of labor except for our ideas, our concepts, our camaraderie with others, that we even live in these spaces that feel disembodied, uh, hazy, uh, that we don't have to share our private domestic lives with people at all, but there's a seamless fantasy of capital without labor labor under, uh, under these current conditions, when in fact this is, what, uh, this is what working from home looks like now. It looks like a peek into people's lives. It looks like really messed up audio, uh, fucked up lighting. <laughs> but I'm really uh, thinking more about the sign that we see over Francis's shoulder to work from hope, this like small gesture of editing. And what hope means in, um, in a moment where we are living really in these conditions of disruption, of mourning, of precarity, but still using that as a set of uh, empowerment and resiliences. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and the closing note. Um, yeah, I, was, I, I really enjoyed the way you brought together these these two projects, um, Home Bodies and The Long Dream. And I hope that the exhibition can be seen, um, the current one, by a lot of people, um, given, given the urgencies and given this collapse mm -hmm. and conflation between, um, as you called it, atomized labor and what others have also thought of as the cellularization of life. Yes, yes. Um, yes. It's also thinking of James Baldwin writing Mm. Perhaps home is not a place, but simply an irrevocable condition. And so also how the notion of the stranger, estrangement, and this idea of home as placemaking, but also as migratory condition um, has been thought of in so many cyclical uh, ways. And, and mm -hmm. Um, yeah, also, um, perhaps, I mean, this is more, more a comment from my side, but, you know, feel free to take from it um, what you feel is useful. Um, I was also thinking in the beginning, you know, the way that you really um, prefaced your own work with um, this question of the pressures and accountability that have, have been the cause for accountability um, mm -hmm. for um, museums um, to take up the structural change to really take on um, not as um, not as at the level of the word, but really the muscular work of, of mm -hmm. what that entails. Mm -hmm. um, the examples shared, perhaps also you know one um, problem perhaps that that I I kind of sense uh, for all of us uh, from South Asia um, mm -hmm. and from you know moving a little bit away from the Euro-American um, examples, you know, because it feels like those are the examples that uh, sometimes take on uh, in such a dominant mode as well of what the, what the criteria for art workers um, to rebel, to, yes. to reckon with institutional change mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. I mean, just really thinking how you feel also about the vocabularies that are being used and mobilized of, abolition, reparation, repatriation, but repatriation also has the word patrimony in it. 
you know, mm. uh, how and the speed and gravity with which these are being mobilized towards the museum while yeah. there is this slashing of budgets and loss of jobs and, you know, how do we hold these, uh, these together? And especially this mm -hmm. question of abolition or the, the tearing down of monuments, you know, there's, there's so much of this. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, not to ask too much of you, of, you know, of you, but I just really feel that your reading is, is essential and it would be great if you could elaborate. Um, mm. My gosh, okay, Natasha. <laughs> so much, so much. Um, I actually agree with you about this a kind of um, centering of the U.S. debates, language, and terms uh, as the, the as the core of a lot of these conversations. If anything, you know, I, I mentioned to my partner yesterday about the fact that in all the work that I do, the data and the research I did into the Art Workers Coalition, looking at uh, the work that's done and the archives that are done, no one actually said that this was a wholly New York phenomenon. It's amazing how the, the, the practice was totally universalized, and you all have to forgive me for not even saying that this was a New York-based phenomenon, but it was just simply presumed that what happened there would then start setting the model for everywhere. So this kind of universalizing, not only of the states, but even the New York art world as the center of all these debates uh, uh, is problematic and needs to be problematized. Now, how much knowledge I have of these other, uh, these other models Models. Well, this is what we're here to kind of work through this week. But I will say that there is something interesting in what you have um, just laid out in terms of this quote by Baldwin. These are the also the terms and languages that have come to the fore for uh, as demands placed on museums right now. And what Baldwin has done is really thought about the conditions of Black life as a conceptual one that it's something that exists outside of the kind of totalizing political realities, but there are ways in which one holds these ontological conditions. Um, and that is the core of the being rather than uh, the effects of uh, let's say social injustices, racism, homophobia, what have you. It's not to say that the other, the latter can, has to be discounted. It's just that there is something else operable here. Um, and I, I would like to hold that idea of, of existing outside of the normal ideas of kind of historical and social time. These are the, what are the calls now for museums? These calls for justice that are in many ways righteous but they kind of come from a very linear sense of history. And it's the sense of history that can turn around and become, and, and can be sort of recaptured. That if we just get the works from one context to its originary space, that things will be all right. If we simply um, uh, think about uh, recasting the museum in the space of, of, of black liberation, then things will be all right. First of all, I would love to see that happen, but I don't want to presume that that becomes the end project. Um, that we have to actually look at models of behavior, of action, of what does it mean to think about practices that, are, that incorporate other forms of knowledge, outside of the academy? What does it mean to bring in other forms of, 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 uh, of exhibition making, i.e. collective practice over individual authorial authority? What does it mean to actually just become aware of one's positionality as a curator, that you constantly speak from a set of education, knowledge, and, and positionality? And to not universalize that voice, those to me are the very basic practices that we have to start looking at um, before we can even begin the project of structural change. Um, and I was also wondering, you know, have you been thinking through the kind of um, hierarchies that exist within uh, museum teams? Because one of the things I was reading mm -hmm. was of course that um, the fact that during pandemic, um, there are bigger museums who have actually laid off educators. And this seems so much in contradiction uh, mm -hmm. because this labor of interpretive work, 
um, mm -hmm. you know, and again, who does that interpretive work? I mean, that's, that's been something that's been a recurring uh, topic. And there are a lot of, um, again, younger members of the art community who are laying down these terms and are saying, we're actually rejecting what has been the norm um, hmm. so far. And we're not willing to actually enter the institution in its current structure. So that there's something really uh, for us to think about, those of us who are in you know, relatively comfortable senior positions, how do we reconcile our work with these kinds of urgent demands? Yeah, I mean, this, these acts of refusals are really potent um, and actually kind of beautiful. And look, in my museum, the NCA Chicago has not been immune from this either. We are on the receiving end of petitions, uh, protests, uh, and letters from both an artist community and an activist community. And, you know, well, you know, well taken. Well taken. Again, we all are grappling really with what it means to deal with this right now. But I am interested in the ways in which it's not just a generational refusal, but many folks, um, folks older than I, are refusing to even participate in my exhibitions. And the best that I can do is maintain a conversation with these folks, even if we're not maintaining a kind of, of, of let's say, uh, exhibitionary relationship. I like to also think about our curatorial practice as excessive of the museum structures when we are working in museums. And I think there's a, an amazing way to think about this, no matter where we're practicing, uh, where in the world we're practicing, if we're inside institutions. What is our relationship to uh, each other as cultural workers. I go back to the term that you brought up, Natasha, this kind of custodianship. We are custodians of the futures of the narratives that are told around art and artists, not just custodians of the institutions that presume to totalize those narratives and wholly hold those narratives. Yes, I'm also thinking about the hierarchies, but more the intersections of um, who's in and out the museum. Again, this for me comes back to questions of a kind of labor practice. The sort of education and interpretive folks who are being laid off in museums are temporary workers. They're unprotected workers. And the question for many institutions is, you know, why in what feels like a, a state of emergency, um, is that the first thing to go? Now, I don't mm -hmm. run an institution. Uh, I don't have to answer that question. I'm happy at my institution that has not come to pass. But what happens in the removal or let's say the, the sort of getting these part-time workers off the payroll um, is that you're removing mostly in the states people of color. You're removing uh, artists and you're removing young people from your roles, i.e. the most precarious. And I do think there needs to be a greater sensitivity to what that means as museums put up black squares and really push for calls for, for racial and social justice. Thank you. Um, I have one question and then we have one from the audience before we close. Mm -hmm. um, I, I understand that you mentioned that it, it, isn't, it, it isn't possible to speak in depth about um, the Grief and Grievance Art and Mourning in America show um, of Oku and Vezor. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is that includes 37 artists. I mean, this is the information that is online uh, that would take place at the new museum. Um, I am, however, interested in this notion of collective authorship. Um, mm -hmm. Also, what that means, uh, you know, as an afterlife to such an immense, uh, towering personality as mm -hmm. Okwe, um, his particularities, his own. Uh, dogmas and exclusions, his own kind of radical imagination and poetical capacity. You know, all of those aspects of this, this figure um, and what role he has played uh, in, a, in, a, in a very internationalist sense, in a sense that um, for uh, the African world, for the South Asian world, there are so many perspectives from which to read his work. And those perspectives mm -hmm. may or may not align. And, and that is also what is beautiful um, and excessive about his role and his continuing labor. Yes. At the same time, you know, how do we, um, how do we maximize on, on his lessons while not turning him into 
you know, the kind of official curricula of curating, um, mm -hmm. because that again is a way of fossilizing perhaps um, such a figure. Um, so if you could perhaps share a little bit, you know, in those terms, rather than, I mean, rather than the exhibition, but really, mm -hmm. really also this triad of, you know, all the world's futures, post-war, and then this exhibition. Yes, yes. You know, how do you do the curatorial work without falling to hagiography? Uh, essentially, you know, how do we um, try to uh, continue a project, but also maybe really um, contend with the fact that those particularities are going to disappear with the absence of the originary curator. I think that that's really kind of spot on. You know, this project um, for me has been fascinating because for two reasons. One is that it is, um, it's the first time that I see Okui really hyper-focused on one nation. Um, and that was interesting to me. And I do believe in that sort of hyper-focus on the US and its context, um, that this is to be taken as an exemplar, but not yet the model for a kind of way of thinking internationally. I do think that's really important, that this is about the particularities of a kind of condition um, that can't easily be mapped on every geography. And so it's important to think about that. But I am also interested in a model of thinking through time that goes through Oakley's projects, which you've already kind of pointed out with some of these titles, all the world's futures, post-war, what have you, right? Um, and this sense of, of, of uh, grappling with the long durée of time is important for me, especially as I call myself a contemporary curator. I believe the contemporary is a perspective and not necessarily just a time period. It is a way to position oneself with a certain set of practices and knowledges that can extend into either direction, into the past and into the future. And this is a kind of lesson that I've taken from Oakley. You know, this project, Grief and Grievance, starts with this particular bookends, uh, one being the Gettysburg Address of 1863 in the middle of the American Civil War. Here is Lincoln trying to memorialize the dead um, and talking around this question of enslavement, which was the core of the war. Uh, and then the other bookend is 2016. It's Trump running for president. And he goes to Gettysburg as if he can kind of reoccupy the space of Lincoln. And so what has happened in the proposal for this project is this question of what? What are the conditions that still inform our today that were set forth in 1863 that are the conditions of the contemporary now? Um, and so that attunement to being able to see the sort of lasting rippling effects of history um, are the things that I take with me uh, and from Oakley. Thank you. And the last question um, is by Benedict Abadio, who says, Javier Tellez recently called in Alpes a call to attention for the manipulation, obliteration of the images of COVID victims in the press where apart from romanticized farewells, the victims are faceless, most of the victims being minority and at-risk population. This contrary to historical war times, where images are many times manipulated to serve government's interest, would curators have a response or a stand on this? Um, going fast forward, are we going to see the images like we are going through the 60s now? Parallels between 60s images in the press at the time and COVID now. Mm -hmm. uh, great question. It's something that I tried to grapple with, in fact, in my essay for uh, the Grief and Grievance Project, which is really what is the register and effects of images historically and what are they now? And I think they are radically different. This is what I tried to get at with this conversation around Sean Leonardo's work in conversation with the request and even demands from the mother of Tamir Rice. Look, there was a moment when an image was always thought to hold some kind of power. This is why we produce media. This is why we disseminate things because we think of them as these kind of fact giving vehicles that a picture will somehow lay out uh, a condition for you that can't be argued. Um, and that is a kind of activist understanding of what images are, have been and can do. But I believe we are in a different moment now with 
hyper media saturation. And even if you set aside for a moment, this kind of uh, proliferation of fake images and doctored images and so forth and so on, which is a real part of our looks kind of screwed up <laughs> condition now uh, in the world. What we also have to talk about is uh, a kind of image fatigue. And that we are living in a moment where we are living under a constant barrage of images so that the effect is not about mobilizing sympathy or activism. It is actually about a deep psychographic, um, psychographic trauma for some folks. Uh, and we need to understand that these, this is the world that we're living in. And we need to also curate and practice with the sensitivity to the traumas that images can hold now. That said, I also want to say that ambivalence, again, thinking through the long durée, is an ambivalence that communities such as my own have been living with also for years. And I'm thinking about the ways in which many people sort of um, held on and uh, to and proliferated this kind of reproductions of lynching photographs, uh, the souvenirs created around these uh, moments of black death as a kind of activist tool. And already in the 19th century, there were debates about whether or not it was appropriate to circulate these images. These are also images that you see recurring often in, a, in artist practice, um, but with usually erasures and elisions and so I do think there's a different kind of way in which not only are artists working with images now, uh, especially in the media proliferation of images, but there's new sort of sensitivities that we as curators have to bring to the understanding of images now too. Thank you so much, Naomi. Um, there are a few more questions for you, but I'd like to let the attendees know that we're going to have uh, a big round of questions and uh, discussion with all of the curators. So we're going to take note of the questions that are not answered, and then uh, we'll try and take as many as possible on the closing day. And it is also an invitation for you all to continue to stay with us and join us on the concluding day. Um, I'd like to simply add a, a, a closing you know, note um, through the very pertinent book of Anne Boyer, uh, The Undying, A Meditation on Modern Illness, uh, she notes, the history of illness is not the history of medicine. It is the history of the world. Yes. And the history of having a body could well be the history of what is done to most of us in the interest of the few. Um, I mean, this is something that is, has been resonating in my mind. And I do feel that it speaks to what has been shared today. Um, I'd also like to... Um, invoke the memory of artist, curator, and researcher Marion von Osten, um, mm -hmm. who was an extremely generous presence. Um, and I, I believe someone who uh, would have a lot to add to these kind of conversations because she believed that the exhibition practice and exhibition making um, should not be considered important due to its uh, formal contours and connotations but only if the exhibition was a transversal space that created linkages to other forms of practices, as she yes. said, and that she deeply believed that it was the politics of these exhibitions to enlarge the field of actors who could participate mm. in the exhibition space that gave it that sense of gravity and purpose. And I hope that that is something that we can take away um, and fulfill within our own practices. Um, yes. So on that note, thank you, everybody. Um, please stay with us for the consecutive days. Um, have a good evening. Have a good day. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Natasha. Bye-bye.